This damnation from The Godfathers on Revenge of the 80s Radio. The Godfathers have a new album coming out on February 10th. A big, bad, beautiful noise. On the phone with me now in Studio B, the band's lead vocalist, Peter Coyne. Welcome to Revenge of the 80s Radio, Peter. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everybody. Pleased to meet you. We're very happy to have you on. And before we get to the new album, let's take it from the beginning, because we Mm -hmm. like to. The Godfathers quickly burst onto the international music scene and were a mainstay on college radio here in the U.S., starting with the first single back in 85. But you and your brother Chris were not simply new to the punk alternative music scenes in the U.K. You were there as the Sid Presley Experience. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good band, the Sid Presley Experience, but I think there was one too many arguments. So we only lasted for like two singles and... About a year and a half, two years of touring. So um, it, it finished quite quickly when it shouldn't have done. We just appeared on national TV in the UK on a, a program called The Tube. And then uh, it finished it was a couple of months after that sort of thing. And quick, very straight away, without missing a beat, uh, we formed The Godfathers. I guess you can say Sid Presley has left the building. All right, that's really bad. Sid Presley has definitely left the building. <laughs> I think The Godfathers is always a better name anyway. I like that. Were you guys fans of the movie? What, the Sid Presley Experience movie? Oh, excuse me. No, I was, I was actually thinking of the Godfather movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Godfather movie. Just, I'm, I'm just joshing you. Yeah, of course we was. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I can remember clear, crystal clear when uh, the Godfather movie first came on British TV because I didn't see it at the cinema at the time. Uh, and in those days, you had to wait five years between releases uh, of the movie coming out in the cinema and then being on terrestrial UK TV. So it was Christmas 1977. And it was like, wow, what a film this is. Do you know what I mean? Because you couldn't, you couldn't buy DVDs or videos in those days. You had to you know, either sit at the cinema or wait for it to appear on TV. And uh, knocked out by that film. Um, I love Godfather the first movie, but I think Godfather 2 is even better. The sequel is even better. What do you think of the third one? Not so happy with that, to be quite honest with you. Um, there's some good scenes in it, some really good scenes, some great actors. Eli Wallach is fantastic. Oh, no, in Sicilia, when he gets given that chocolate in the opera house. That's <laughs> marvellous stuff. But um, uh, it's because it's at the end of an epic, do you see what I mean? And uh, it just didn't it's not up to snuff like one and two. Anybody would tell you that, and I'm telling you that. All their fans say that to me as well. They're like, uh, the third movie doesn't exist. No, no such thing. Now they're going to have a remake. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was about the movies or each one of you became a godfather at the same time. Uh, anyway, after the Sid Presley experience broke up, uh, you and Chris formed the godfathers. Uh, there was a similar yep. sound between the two, but there were also some differences. So, so what musically... Did you intend to do a little differently with The Godfathers than with the Sid Presley Experience? I always thought, to be honest with you, that the Sid Presley Experience, great band as it was, we made a couple of good records, Public Enemy Number 1 and Hot 2, 3, 4 were the best. But I always see the Sid Presley Experience in black and white and The Godfathers in Technicolor. And I think there's a difference. It's got two guitars for a start, and that really helped out live, really helped on writing new music, really helped on lots of things. Visually on stage, it was much more important to make that sort of two-guitar statement as well. And uh, I, I just think, you know, the Godfathers made better records than the Sid Presley experience. It takes some time for any artist to gain international acclaim, Peter, but the Godfathers' such success came rather quickly. How surprised or maybe not surprised were you with the rather fast attention given your music around the English-speaking world? It was good. We enjoyed that. That's nice. I mean, we got out to America straight away with the Godfathers. We, I think we was together as a band for about five weeks, six weeks, and we was playing at four dates in America. New York, uh, New Jersey, Boston, Philadelphia, I think. It was four dates within like six weeks of us actually forming and then playing in America. So we got out to America quite quickly. America took to our music very quickly. This Damnation was um, quite a big one. You mentioned earlier on those college uh, radio networks and all the subsequent releases like Birth School, Work, Death, and Because uh, I Said So, Unreal World, She Gives Me Love, all, all those kind of songs were very big on the college radio network. And Birth School, Work, Death went top 40 in the States. So 
I, I guess that's doing pretty good. That's doing pretty good. I remember, <coughs> excuse me, we used to go to uh, checking at the airport, uh, um, getting off a long flight from London to New York or Los Angeles or somewhere, and uh, this guy asked me, and he said, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, a customs officer, what's the purpose of your visit? I said, business. He said, what kind of business are you in? I said, I'm in a band. And he said, what's the name of the band? And I said, The Godfathers. And he went, The Godfathers? This damnation. Great record. Bang. Stamped the passport and I was in. All no right. problem whatsoever. So things like that were, were pretty fantastic, really quite enjoyable. A great way to get through customs. And hopefully they didn't lose your sure, luggage either. Very quick. <laughs> Express service, baby. A thing that didn't change that much from your days with the Sid Presley experience were the snaz and suits, Peter. Well, one can take those uh, cool suits as a reference to the Godfathers. It's something about a band that rocks in suits that adds an extra element to his presence, don't, don't you think? Listen, I love bands that put something into what they're doing on stage. You know, you didn't get the, 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 the four tops or the temptations rocking up in, you know, trainers and they just slipped out of bed. These guys look slick. These guys look smart. These guys were putting on a show. Do you know what I mean? And also, the, the, what we do... You know, we don't. It's not a uniform. We're not the Beatles. We don't wear this four identical outfits or anything like that. But we like to look sharp and look smart on stage, and that's the contrast between we might look clean and we might look smart, but our music is down and dirty as it gets. Do you know what I mean? So people see and then they hear. So you you see this coming on stage, and then bang, you give them like an onslaught of rock and roll music, and, it, and it's great to see. It's great to watch the audience reactions, jaws dropping, literally, and stuff like that. It's brilliant. You also brought the suits back into an era that was dominated by the hair bands and the soon-to-be grungers and the, uh, let's say, relatively slovenly attire. Who wants to see a band who looks like they're roadie? Right, there you go. Uh, you guys come on in the slick yeah. suits, and, and fans of your band <laughs> knew it. They, they see you on the cover, they're saying, this is, this is going to be slick, this is going to be great. And they, they, then they hear some really kind of old-school punk, almost... Uh, I mean, obviously it's your own sound, but there's it, it, you take it back to the clash with suits, and you you sort of bring it to another level. That's what it seems like when you're when when people hear your music and see you play at the same time. Right. We don't really think of our music as punk. Obviously, we was inspired by punk music, and I went to see lots of punk bands and grew up during that sort of era. Sex Pistols, Buzzcocks, they'd be my favourite sort of British sort of punk bands. But we're not. The Godfather's not a punk band. We're, we're rock and roll. We've always been rock and roll music, right from the start and right up to our new album, A Big Bad Beautiful Noise. Rock and roll music, the beauty in rock and roll is that it encompasses everything, everything that we love about music. Rock and roll can be psychedelic, rock and roll can be rockabilly. Like we played, you know, we played and wrote a song called Walking Talking Johnny Cash Blues because we like that kind of country sort of rockabilly music. You know, there's many levels and areas of rock and roll music. That's what's so fantastic about it. And, um, you know, at, when we started at the time in the 80s, there wasn't so many rock and roll bands. And now there's hardly any rock and roll bands. So perhaps the Godfathers are the very last of the rock and roll bands that are out there. We're still breathing. We're still kicking. We still sound big, bad and beautiful. You know, that, that's, we'll, we'll do that until we drop dead, you know, and that's it. We call it rock and roll music. We play the Godfathers style of rock and roll music. And we're very happy to do that. It seems that rock music did kind of fall a little bit by the wayside as far as the uh, um, popular music scene, or I'll, I'll say the mainstream radio stations, aside from maybe classic rock and a couple of uh, bands here and there. But you get big audiences. You see the, the demand there. What do you think is going on? Everything is so safe nowadays. Everything is so corporate nowadays. Everything is so middle to upper class nowadays. There doesn't seem to be any room anywhere for working class people to make an artistic statement if you look at all the British actors that are coming up at this moment in time, they're all, they all went to Eton Public School, same as the Prime Minister went to Eton. I'm surprised that the Pope didn't go to Eton uh, Public School, but, you know, there's, there's basically there's an artistic imbalance that's stopping working class people from getting out there and making their statement and making their music, whether it's in uh, music or films, and I think that sucks in general, that sucks. For instance, you would not get a Sex Pistols nowadays. It's just not possible. Or a Slade nowadays, because those bands are working-class people. They would not get the chance to do their stuff nowadays. 
And that's a shame. That's a big, big shame. And that's the big difference. Everything is too corporate and everything is too upper and middle class. Sorry if I sound like an inverted stop, but I am. Maybe the industry executives should uh, hop around some of the college towns and watch some of the uh, uh, younger kids flipping through vinyl albums looking for older bands like the ones we just mentioned. I think um, there are great bands out there, and I don't know. It's supposed to be a lot easier with the internet to reach out to people, but trust me, it's not. It makes it more difficult for you in a way because the internet gets clogged up with everything else. Like, you know what I mean? Like a U2 or a radio head's going to take over, you know, a certain chunk of the internet, and you, you try and get through it. Impossible. Impossible. Peter Coyne of The Godfathers is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. We're going to talk about their new album, A Big Bad Beautiful Noise, straight ahead. Hut 234 from the Sid Presley Experience on Revenge of the 80s Radio. That band was Peter and Chris Coyne's precursor to The Godfathers. I'm Chris Cordani. Peter is with me now. They have a new album coming out February 10th, A Big Bad Beautiful Noise. Peter, the band kept a distinct sound that still evolved musically over the decades. And still, you not only stay true to your longtime fans, but you keep getting new younger ones, many of whom are starving for something different, like we kind of alluded to in the last segment, from what they've been fed. Right. Uh, for a start, we're not really... We love... The history of music in The Godfathers. Everybody's fans of somebody here, there, and everywhere, obviously. Um, We're very proud of the history that The Godfathers have had over the last 30, over 30 years. But we're not, we don't live in the past. You know, the most important album for The Godfathers is always going to be the next one. We don't want to rely on uh, reflected glory or replicating our history from before. We want to write and communicate about what's happening now, and that's what we've done with this new album, A Big Bad Beautiful Noise. It's got lots of different textures on it. We don't want to repeat ourselves ever. It's not Birth School Work Death Volume 2. It's not Hit by Hit, the sequel. It's not more songs about love and hate, the follow-up. This is A Big Bad Beautiful Noise. And it talks about, on that album, about lots of things that are happening in the UK, America, all over Europe, the whole shebang. You know, the, the title track is like, a, you know, we, we've done social comment numbers before. You played This Damnation earlier, and we're quite famous most parts of the world for a song called Birth School Work Death. They're like, you know, commenting on society, and that's what we tried to do with A Big Bad Beautiful Noise, the title track, because it's so depressing and so dark and so horrible out there. You know, we just wanted to let people know... Um, that it's okay to be alive, and I feel so good tonight. It's quite a positive song in its way. It's dark, but it's positive, you know. There's um, quite a few interesting, different, interesting musical textures on this new record. There's a song called Miss America that deals with, um, we didn't know who was going to win or lose that American election. We wrote this song in the middle of, uh, well, it's sort of June or July, 2016 so it was no way could we have predicted who's going to win this american election we're not putting down america with a song called miss america we're just like a lot of people out there we're asking questions and we want some answers same as everybody wants some answers and that's what miss america is all about as well you know but we don't we're not the sort of band that tries to preach to people and say you've got to think like us the best rock and roll bands hold up a mirror to society and say, that is what you look like. And that's what the Godfathers, every now and again, have always tried to do. But it's got to be fun. It's got to be fun. This is entertainment. This is rock and roll music. We've got a message, but we don't want to be boring. We don't want to preach at people. I think God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols is very entertaining. You know, I think Motor City's Burning by the MC5 is very entertaining. I think Schools Out by Alice Cooper is very entertaining. Do you see what I mean? So we take what we like about music, we make our own music, and we, every now and again, we comment on what's going on right here and right now. And I think that's uh, one of the noticeable things that makes the Godfathers fresh and continuous and able to carry on for all these sort of decades. When we go playing out in Europe or the UK, and hopefully we'll get out to the States in 2017, we get lots of different people coming to see us. We get people who was into us 30 years ago and their sons and their kids. So it's good. It's good. I love it. Like, you know, it's great. 
And of course, uh, Miss America is a reference to our election. You guys had quit the election in the UK earlier in the year as well. Yep, we sure did. And that, that's, we sort of dealt with that as well on um, a song called You and Me Against the World, which finishes the album A Big Bad Beautiful Noise. It's sort of musically inspired by the death of David Bowie, which was a massive shock to me, as well as a, a, a loss to everybody around the world. Bowie was a big fan of the Godfathers. He came to see us a couple of times. We hang out with him uh, quite a few times. He wanted to sign us up to his own label. Um, it was a very, very friendly, lovely South London, which is where I'm from, genius. And I was so happy to have met that, that fellow. And I was so sad when he died. I cried when David Bowie died. So the music on uh, You and Me Against the World is sort of inspired uh, by the death of David Bowie. Um, and it's lyrically inspired by all that political fallout from Brexit. Personally, I didn't agree with that. Uh, leaving Europe. I thought it was a big, big mistake. I still think it's a big, big mistake. And um, it starts off very dark, that song, You Me, Against the World, but it ends up as a triumphant love song because love is the glue that holds the whole world together. And that's what we tried to put into that number, You Me, Against the World. It was the only song we thought that could actually finish that album. It had to start big with the title track, A Big Bad Beautiful Noise, it encompassed a lot of things along the way, changing different styles and different gears musically here and there across the whole album, and then finish with that statement, which is big. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely, Peter. And you were saying just a little while ago that uh, your music does relate to people. It, 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 it uh, shows people what they, what they should be looking at themselves uh, as far as in the mirror, but also should be relating to the people that you're playing to. It, it uh, offers stories, offers some insights about, uh, about real people in real situations. The track that hit my head rather quickly was Your Poor Boy's Son. It tells the story of a hard-working fellow, complete with uh, great mining sound effects, by the way, frustrated with his life and situation, wants to get better. But that has been what rock was always about, real life and relatable people. Thank you. I mean, we're poor boy's son. This is uh, obviously an experience that millions and millions and millions of people around the world go through. I mean, the songs The Godfather's Right, I'd like to think, are universal themes. You know, you can enjoy... This record in uh, New York or um, Barcelona or Athens, we just got back from Greece. All these songs will relate to people because that's what they're meant to do. You're, you're starting a conversation with somebody by listening to a record. I mean, when I was growing up, I used to listen to people like Lou Reed, David Bowie, Iggy Pop, um, guys like that, Roxy Music. And then I got into sort of punk rock and then it sort of sort of took off from there do you know what i mean i like songs that can relate to real life i like songs that can fire your imagination make you feel alive you know poor boy son um it's it's gritty it's gritty but it's, it's rock and roll music it's got this fantastic like rock and roll type piano on it and uh it's got some hooks and things here and there lots of sleazy guitars we just wanted to sum up what it's like for people out there, if they're lucky enough to have a job, you know, because they work you to death nowadays. That's why it says, you know, first line is, I've been working from eight till five. It used to be, you know, you work from nine till five. But no, they want to squeeze another hour out of you. So what we tried to do was just um, sort of come up with uh, a song that summed up a work experience for, for somebody. You know, I really like that number. Actually, love it. Peter Coyne is with me on Revenge of the 80s Radio. The Godfathers have a brand new album. It's called A Big Bad Beautiful Noise, and there are a lot of big bad beautiful noises in it. What I like also, and I want to point this out, and, and you alluded to it just a few moments ago, your music is about real people. It's about real life. It's about uh, situations. It's about, it's about what's happening. But you put that together and you make it easier to communicate with your audience because you have catchy guitar riffs. You, you have some uh, rock sensibility. You're, uh, you understand the value of a hook when it comes to sending a message and putting together good music. Right. Thank you. We, we try, obviously, you know, like I said, you know, what we do is entertainment. We're a rock and roll band. We're there to uh, give something to people in their lives, whether it's on a record or on stage, you know, make people happy. You know, we can make people happy with our miserable music. 
that's our job. Do you see what I mean? So um, it's it's just what you know. We love to do that. We love to do that. Now your first release will be on February third. It'll be the single "You Don't Love Me," and uh, that sounds uh-huh. a little depressing too. But really, it's again. Tell me. Let's talk about the track. Uh, "You Don't Love Me." It's I think it's classic, catchy pop music. I think it's super melodic. I think once you've heard this song and it gets inside your head, it's never going to leave. It, it's so catchy. That's why we decided, even though there's lots of different textures, lots of great songs on The Big Bad Beautiful Noise, that's why we picked that as the first single to come off the album, because it was just so catchy. Like, if you listen to a lot of Cure's uh, singles by The Cure, you know, they release songs like Love Cats or um, Friday I'm In Love or Boys Don't Cry or something like that. They don't really release the darker their uh, uh, side of the cure on, on single. That's on the album. So we just wanted to release something that was dead, dead catchy. Like I said, once it gets inside your head, it's never going to leave. I think it's a great song, really catchy, like, you know. It definitely is. Now, already before the release, your album has received a lot of critical acclaim, and this acclaim includes some contextually complimentary curse words within the praise for emphasis. Are there any other tracks that stand out to you the most? For, for me, I'm really, really proud of this record. I think it's probably the best album the Godfathers have ever made. Um, this, every song on it is really important to me. Um, what can I say? Miss America, I've spoke about that one. What I like about Miss America, it's got this really spooky theremin on it and some great guitar work, some 12-string guitar on that. There's a track called Defibrillator, which is like proper, you know, rock music. You know, quite dark, quite heavy. It's about death and resurrection, but it's just, it's, it's just intense from start to finish, and it only lasts for about two minutes and ten seconds. There's a song called She's Mine on the album. I sort of wrote that for my wife, uh, Karen. But it's not really... It's, it's about her, but it's about womankind, if you see what I mean. And I think that's a beautiful thing to do. Like I said, we write social comment numbers, but we will always, always, always try and write a really, really beautiful love song. And we, I think we succeeded there with She's Mine and you and me against the world like you know there's another couple of rockers on the album one called feedback in which was a lot of fun to record because it's quite complicated that one to play because it's got so many sort of different sections in it and um that that that's great it's you know it kicks and it keeps kicking that number there's a song called let's get higher i won't go into lyrically what it's about but maybe people out there can make it their own mind up about that and um, there was a song on there called um, uh, Till My Heart Stopped Beating, which we released last year as a single in the UK to celebrate our 30th anniversary as a band. And that's, I don't know, that one's, it's like a wall of sound, uh, Till My Heart Stops Beating. And it's about the triumph of the human spirit in a way, I suppose. So lots of really, really good songs on the album, I think. One Good Reason, that's another song that's on the album. That's sort of like, Maybe a little bit Lou Reed, a little bit Velvet Underground. I don't know. It's up to other people to make their mind up. But it's quite a diverse album. It's quite fresh sounding. We're getting lots of uh, really, really positive feedback from this record straight away. And it's not even been released yet. There's a couple of things that might be happening in the States, which I can't talk about now. But I really, fingers crossed, they all come off and we do actually get out there to tour America in May because that's what we want to do is um, uh, tour America in, and Canada in, in May 2017. And if it does happen, that American tour, it's going to start off with something very, very special. I, I can't discuss it because it's not 100%. We've been offered to do this. And all I can say is they've, they've offered this to people of the caliber before, of people like Brian Wilson and Willie Nelson to do this thing. So if we do it, and we've been asked to do it, um, it'll be a massive honor for the Godfathers to do this thing. You can find out more about tour dates and where they're going to be in America, the UK, or anywhere else on the Godfathers website, godfathers.uk.com. That's godfathers.uk.com. Peter, before we go, you have a new Godfathers lineup with this album, or slightly new. Can you tell us a bit about these fine musicians? This is a real killer lineup of the Godfathers. Um, you've got two guitar 
players, uh, Steve Crittle and Mara Venegas. Basically, all the songs on the album were written by everybody in the band, but principally by myself and Steve, Steve Crittle, or myself and Mara Venegas. But everybody, uh, Tim James on drums and Darren Birch on bass, definitely, definitely, definitely made a super contribution to this album. All I can say about this lineup is that it's, I think it's just as good as the original lineup, if not better than the original lineup of the Godfathers. We're on fire on stage. We've been playing uh, quite big festivals, like we played the Isle of Wight Festival in the UK earlier this year, and lots of big festivals throughout Europe. And we've been touring, you know, quite quite intensely uh, throughout Europe all this year as well. We played Germany. Spain. We just got back from a massive tour of Greece. We played France. We played Holland. Lots um, and, and people love this lineup of the band live. It sounds fantastic, and it's got this uh, visual element, like I was saying, with the guitars. These are all characters in this band, and they're not shy about putting themselves forward and uh, putting everything they've got into their music, which is exactly how it should be. Peter Coyne, thank you once again for coming on with us here on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate that. Love, love talking to you, mate. Once again, it's thegodfathers.uk.com. The new album, A Big Bad Beautiful Noise. Let's play a track from that. Poor Boy's Son, brand new from The Godfathers.